Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is December 19, 2012. And um, we are so fortunate to have our group of elementary school teachers and people interested in elementary school and quad blogging and blogging. And uh, those are some of our topics tonight. And uh, I think we'll have people introduce themselves. Um, and Gail and Susie maybe can kick off what we're going to be talking about here in a second. Well, why don't, why don't you just just uh, jump right in and say what the topic is or what what you were thinking, Gail, and then Susie, you maybe back it up a little bit. And I do want to circle back to um, spending some time here at the beginning to talk about um, what happened um, up in, in Connecticut, and um, you guys are all working with children, so it would be interesting to kind of hear your reactions and your kids' reactions and so forth. It, it just seemed kind of crazy to have a, a group of elementary school teachers here and then not talk about that, so a little bit, just to kind of see where you all are. So there we go. And then we'll get our, we'll, we'll hear people's names here in a second. Um, but Gail Desler, um, introduce yourself, please, and then... Um, oh, l let me remind everybody that most people will listen to this on a podcast, so they won't necessarily see who's talking. So it, saying your name and where you're from and all that is is a really good thing for the audio listeners. So Gail, go ahead. Okay. So um, hi, everybody. I'm Gail Dessler, and I'm a teacher for the Elk Grove School District, which is South Sacramento in California. And I live up in the foothills. Um, I'm, I actually don't have my own class. Um, my job is technology integration specialist. So I work with teachers in grades K through 12. So um, this week I wasn't actually with students um, with the, the aftermath of um, the shootings, but um, really appreciated having resources such as the um, New York Times Learning Network um, and the National Council for Teachers of English to be able to send those out to teachers um, to invite those conversations. And then, Paul, do you want to just deal talk about yeah. that first? Or oh, hey, Mar Margaret just yeah, joined well, us. Yeah, hey. no. Hi, Margaret. Welcome. Why don't we get into um, so, uh, we'll, we'll get we'll get back to that. Okay. Your your district is also an EduBlog um, district. Is that right? Do you want to? We I yeah, mean, we it actually, seems pertinent. So yeah, good. <laughs> Yeah. Well, actually, you know, what this Hi, is all about for me tonight, oh, great, and Kevin's here too. Yay. Hi, Kevin. So um, about a month ago, I read um, a post by Susie um, in which she Susie gave Boss. a link to, yeah, Susie Boss, who's here with us tonight, and she gave a link to, um, uh, to quad blogging. And I went to that link and thought this is very cool and I could go through and on a Google Doc I could see that teachers had signed up their classrooms you know, from all over the world um, and the way it worked is you had a somebody assigned um, and you'd have a team of four and then each week you know one school one classroom it was their turn to blog on a topic and the other three participating members of the quad team um, would then respond. And I thought that was pretty cool because, you know, I do a lot of workshops on introducing teachers to blogging, you know, and initially they're, they're really world, they're really wor worried that they're going to be overwhelmed, the entire world is going to find them, and then pretty soon they realize um, actually nobody's finding them. And it, uh, especially <laughs> for our, our Title I sites where the kids maybe don't have um, internet connection at home, that gets a little discouraging um, when they realize, you know, we could have a real audience, an authentic audience, but we don't. So I was pretty excited about the quad blogging, but I went in because I, when Susie posted it, it was towards the tail end. And it looks like they do like three months at a time. Mm -hmm. so Susan, I, do, you, do you want to pick it up from there a little bit and summarize? Your article was in Edutopia, is that right? And, yes, sure. And, yeah, go ahead. So I'll jump in. September, in. So I think. But yeah, we're, we're a little behind the game here. But that's okay. No, it, it's a great time because I think the <laughs> new year will be, um, there'll be some new opportunities, as Gail says. So, um, so I write yeah, for, yeah. you know, oh, hi. Hi there. 
So I'm a regular, you know, blogger for Edutopia, so I'm always looking for interesting leads on stories or just what are teachers talking about. And in Portland, Oregon, where I live, we have a pretty active EdCamp community. So I'd been to an EdCamp recently. We have them quarterly. And a couple of teachers were just casually talking about quad blogging and what their quad blog was focused on. And I thought, you know, I don't know what that is, but I'm curious because they were having um, interesting results and I asked them a little about it. And um, so I thought this would be, you know, a great post. I started investigating a little bit, looking online, and talked to a couple of teachers. And I just kind of threw out a, a tweet asking, um, hoping that a teacher I had talked to earlier would get back in touch with me and fill me in a little more on her experience. And instead, I heard right away, um, got a, a tweet response right away from um, his Twitter handle is Deputy Mitchell. His name is David Mitchell, and he's a UK um, educator and the founder of this idea. And okay. um, you know, within a half. Sure. Within a half hour, we were um, in a Skype call. And I'm getting some background yeah. noise here. Um, can you hear me? Okay, though. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so we were, you know, we were in a Skype call. It was late at night for him, but he said, "No, no worries. I have a new baby. I'm up all the time anyway." So you know, it was just great. And for me, it was a great example of a teacher with a good idea. He was just passionate about. Um, the value he saw when he got his students blogging because they in his school is a primary school in Bolton, England, and the um, boys in particular were not doing well um, on their writing assessments. And he wanted to do something about it. He had a hunch that blogging would help. Um, it did, and the more audience he could bring to kids, the better the results. The more motivated they were to write, which makes sense to all of us. And um, so he just made it his business to grow their audience, and I think he told me in a one-year period his grade six class had a million hits, um, and I don't know how many comments. But I mean, they're they're a phenomenon in the UK. You know, they they have presented at BET, which is bigger than ISTE. Those of you who have been to the ISTE conference, BET's even larger, and they've been on the main stage there talking about how. You know, they use blogging and how it's changed, how they feel about writing and education. and So that's the backstory a little bit. And um, I posted, and I, I think uh, that's been a popular um, post. I, I think it's brought more teachers from around the world to his site, which was just the, you know, what he was hoping for because the more, um, you know, the more the merrier. So that's sort of what brings us together. I, I want to identify that, you know, whoop, we got an echo there going on. But that um, Margaret Simon is here, and Margaret has, um, in the past, uh, done some work on, on Voices on the Golf, which we had for a while, and then some of her students came over to Youth Voices. So one of the issues that we've been talking about um, at different times is issues, uh, just to throw some of these issues out there, is like, when do you become an individual blog, and when do you want to be on a group blog, like Youth Voices? And when um, there are high school students and elementary school students, is that too big of a, a, a stretch? Those are some of the kinds of questions. And and so it seemed obvious to in, in, to invite Matt Hardy, who started um, Kid Blog as well, to to join us in in, in in those kinds of questions because your blog is or your site is a group blog. Is that right? Uh, yeah, it's it's actually sort of a. Uh, hybrid, depending on how you want to run it as a teacher. Um, every student does have their own individualized uh, space where their content sort of lives in their own world, but the nature of the organization of the, that content is that a classroom sets up this sort of community space and there is a, a feed that, that presents all of those posts in aggregate as well. So it sort of like automatically aggregates what a lot of people spend a lot of time gathering RSS feeds from different blogs that their students are doing. KidBlog does all that for you automatically. So it really facilitates that um, group conversation, but also gives students that individualized space. And that's something that you built um, off of a WordPress um, site. Is that what I understand? Correct. Yeah. So we're, our our back end is powered by WordPress. So if you really if you know WordPress, you'll you'll recognize that. Although we've done quite a bit of customization to make it uh, make it accessible to students, you know, even even our youngest students. Cool. So I got to tell you, I was, I was jealous because Margaret Simon, who's here, said that she's had, her kids are on KidBlog. So I'm like, 
Oh man, but that's okay. <laughs> um, and I say I say that this I say that to say that um that we're not going to come up with any um, answers to any of these issues tonight. Um, but we would like to have a plan where kids are getting read. I think that's the main thing. How do we get kids read, and how do we connect? between our different silos that we've kind of cre created for, you know. I mean, we actually create a silo so kids can, by that I mean youth voices or something, so that kids will get response, right? But then it's hard to break out of that silo to other silos and so forth. So yeah. those are some of the issues that, that we want to get into. And, mm. and I'm sorry if this is uh, kind of crazy, but here's what I'd like to do now. I'd like to get everybody introduced. Um, and as you introduce yourself, um, I, I did... Uh, um, what, what happened up in Newtown, Connecticut, um, is, is probably it's, uh, it's obviously, obviously still on all our hearts and minds. And if you want to make some comment about that and how that's going with you and your kids, um, your students in your class, that would be a great way to introduce yourself. And Gail Pullen, could you introduce yourself? Let's just start sort of alphabetically as we go here. Hi, everyone. Welcome, Gail. My first time here. Let me know if you can't hear me, uh, Paul, because I know I'm a little distant from my uh, laptop. You're good. Oh, good. Um, so on Friday, I got bits and pieces of the story, and that's when I started looking at my. And you're a teacher. kindergarten teacher, did you Correct. say that? Correct. Yes. Okay. okay. And I yes. teach at the same school as Kevin. And okay. Kevin's kind of been my mentor, whether he signed on or not. <laughs> but <laughs> for the last five years, um, I've kind of been following his blog and learning a lot as I go. So, uh, so Friday when the tragedy happened, I just had bits and pieces of it because in a classroom you don't have time to go check the news or check uh, other news media throughout the day. So mm -hmm. I just had bits of information and I just started looking at my class a little differently, a little more like innocence. So mm -hmm. um, as I process things, and I know a lot of us like to process it by writing, I wrote a post on Friday and in it I said I didn't have the answers. I had a few links for people that I could share with them, and including a Fred Rogers video, which I love, that it was talking to parents about the important mm -hmm. things they can share with their students. Um, and uh, then I, I later wrote an email to all my parents uh, in the class, and I talked, gave them some more links, and I and uh, I kind of shared some of my thinking, and then I said that I was not going to be talking about it with the children. But that if it did come up, that I was going to follow it by being reassuring, by listening to them, by keeping it as brief as possible. Uh, turned out, no one mentioned it all week. Hmm. And the parents had done a great job, I guess, of not telling their kids what was going on. They, and those that did gave them only very basic information. So much of it depends on how the adult responds and if the adult is recovered and the adult, the adult is telling the story in a calm way, then the kids can stay calm. So I expect that eventually this story is going to come back. It's going to come up. It may very well come up in some odd time, in some odd conversation that seems like it has no place, but then I'll deal with it then. And I know that the time involved between now and then will do a lot to relax me. I was really tense about uh, having to talk with the kids and I was relieved and exhausted at the end of Monday when it never came up. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, and it strikes me that this is a, actually a pretty good test case of what's appropriate for younger children and what's appropriate for middle children and what's appropriate for older children and how they deal with this kind of this kind of issue too. Mm. But Kevin, welcome. Thank you. Introduce uh, yourself in case people don't know. <laughs> sure, I'm Kevin Hodgson and um, I teach sixth grade in the same school as Gail who just spoke. <laughs> um, and uh, you know in the upper grades uh, we've had some conversations about what happened down in Connecticut which is Moss, um, so not too far away. Um, and uh, it's funny because some classes have been, I teach four different classes and some of them um, have more questions than others. And we've kept it pretty general as well, even with sixth graders, I think. 
Um, you know, one of the things I noticed with uh, my own kids is that by the time I got home from work on Friday, my 12-year-old and 14-year-old knew everything that I knew. <laughs> you know, um, mm. and I didn't have a chance to kind of brace myself to really have to be able to one to kind of share that with them, and, um, and that that's mm. part of that kind of the information flow that. Uh, that is one of the things that I, I celebrate as a teacher, but in that kind of moment, didn't um, as a parent. And then over the weekend, uh, finding ways to talk with our eight-year-old about what was going on, um, probably similar to what Gail, um, the advice that she gave to parents, and you know, we were looking for ways to do it as well. But it, it's a difficult situation, and you know, it, it actually came up today because we were um, looking through the Time for Kids uh, Year in Pictures edition that they put out in December and the December picture there was about some Santa run in New York City you know that was their kind of capturing December 2012 and so our discussion was you know what would you know what would the picture be now and you know and kind of bracing them for all the year in review that they're going to be seeing and and what the highlight is going to be or the what the kind of focus will probably be is um, you know what happened down in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Margaret welcome. Mar Margaret has a dance class that, on Wednesday nights for the last year or so. So, but her but she hurt her ankle, so I was really happy to hear that. <laughs> anyway, welcome, Margaret. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I'm Margaret Simon. I teach um, gifted students, uh, and so I teach a variety of grade levels, all the way from first through sixth grade, and. Um, I, I teach at two different schools, and what and at one of my schools this morning, um, it came up, and I, I you know I wasn't going to bring it up. I was letting letting the kids lead this, um, but it did come up, and they uh, they wanted to talk about it, so we did have a discussion about it, and um, and I asked them, what do you think we could do in response to that? And um, so we brainstormed a number of things we could do um, to respond. And um, <clears throat> because they're because I'm a writing teacher, and we tend to kind of go toward writing when um, whenever um, we can, I talked to them about what way we could write. And they decided to write a song. And uh, they started a song, and it's uh, we haven't completed it yet. And who knows if it'll be completed before the Christmas holidays? But it's very sweet, and it says that you are not alone. And um, I think it's a just a beautiful sentiment um, that they are expressing that um, they want they understand that it's a human condition, a human reaction, and we are all there together. Um, my other school. Um, I kind of just brought it up today with some of my younger students. I just asked them if they had ever heard of Sandy Hook. And they said, no, I haven't heard about it. So I left it alone. And, um, and I will until, until they start talking about it. And it's, 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 you're kind of afraid. You don't want to start a conversation that they're not ready to have. So, um, so I'm just letting my students lead me. Um, one thing about Give to Kids, though, is a lot of the adults in their lives treat them like adults, and they will talk to them um, about issues that, you know, normally a elementary student would not be hearing about. I've found that um, quite often in, in, uh, with my students. But I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm feeling really good about the, um, the way they're responding. Cool. Thanks. Welcome, um, Tony. Uh, let's swing over to you. Introduce yourself. I think this is your first time here too, as well. Yeah, so it's it's my first Charlotte. time. Yeah, okay. my name is Tony Ioni. I uh, teach fourth grade in Charlotte, North Carolina. And um, this past uh, Monday, our principal got on um, like our closed circuit TV, and he felt compelled that he needed to address the you know, the students and reassure them that they were all safe and that uh, we, the teachers, were going to, you know, talk to them some more about it when he got off uh, closed circuit and just field any questions or comments or concerns. So um, when he got off the closed circuit, what I had them do was 
spend about 10 minutes just doing like a quick free write and if they knew anything or had any questions or comments that they wanted to bring up as a class. So they sat there quietly and wrote for a few minutes and um, six or seven of them chose to share afterwards and you know their questions were you know clarity questions you know why would somebody choose to do that you know how, how did this happen a couple of kids you know um, talked about how they felt about it um, I also do this thing at the end of the day um, trying to integrate Twitter into the classroom we do a end of day reflection and um, I, I've only got three computers in my classroom so the kids pick each other each day so everybody gets a turn eventually so um, a couple of kids got on uh, our class Twitter account and kind of tweeted how they felt about it and um, actually talked to a couple other classes that um, were each following and had a little dialogue about it so Mm -hmm. So, Matt or Susie, any further thoughts about this topic? Um, yeah, I, I'm actually, uh, so I'm Matt, co-founder of KidBlog. I've been taught uh, third, fourth, fifth grade for the last uh, eight years. I'm actually not in the classroom this year, so I've been processing this from sort of from the outside in. And I guess the, the most interesting thing that I've noticed is that um, it seems like unlike any of the other occurrences, I think uh, people are acknowledging this. There's something different about this time, and it sounds like um, mm -hmm. no matter what your political persuasion is, that that something's got to give here. And I think that's that's a, just an interesting sort of oh, uh, bigger picture kind of analysis of of this kind of tragedy and how uh, it's unfortunately all too common. Mm -hmm. Susie? Yes, and you know, again, I'm not in the classroom now, so I'm not, um, and just listening to you all, how you process this with your students and just the courage it takes to teach at times like this, um, you're just amazing. Um, but I, I guess I would add that when um, Columbine happened, I was working at a research lab that happened to house the National Resource Center for Safe Schools. At that time, it was a school safety, you know, federally funded program. Um, and, and it just feels like it, it's the parallels are stark. Um, I think the, the nightmare that, you know, um, of recovery is, is very similar and it would be, you know, I, I guess all of our wish that we could learn some lessons finally to move forward and never have to again help students recover from um, a story like this, news like this. Um, so we'll see what happens, I guess. Um, tough, tough week, month, and I think weeks ahead for everybody. And, and just um, I'll add, add that um, one of the, and this is sort of a, a tech thing to say too, but one of the things I've been messing around with recently is uh, Guru. Um, and um, and I put together a Sandy Hook Guru collection of of resources for my students, and and part of part of what I'm excited and, and again I teach on a high school level, but part of what I'm excited about is in Guru is is the mashup that you can do with um, uh, vi Vialogs. Um, is that how you say it? Yeah. The, the video, yeah, dialogues. So that so that so that you can actually put these things inside of another uh, of a container, and then have people, um, and you know, the video becomes interactive. Then also, um, any of the articles or most of the articles that that I'm um, having students read, um, they can annotate right online as well through that using using uh, personal crocodile. Um, and, and so that that kind of um, building something for them to go into and, and mess around with is interesting. Um, I haven't gotten very far with anybody yet, but you know, students students are saying things like, you know, from net for my next inquiry project, I want to do gun control, and I'm like, well, why? <laughs> you know, so so it, it kind of is uh, coming up as as, as we proceed. Mm -hmm. um, Interestingly, the so I, so I, and and having said all of that, um, I just want to say that one of the issues that um, 
I would like to throw into the hopper, and then let's get into this this uh, quad blogging, or what do we want to get out of blogging question if we can? Um, is that youth voices is is in a sense, and I think what we're looking for is more than just correct me if I'm wrong, Gail, but um, but more than just um, being able to talk to each other, but having some shared vision, some shared curriculum, some community. Um, so that when our kids do talk to each other, they're they're kind of on the same page. So that we've been building curriculum for quite a while on Youth Voices, and what I just presented there was is probably not appropriate for elementary school. Gotta say, but um, so that um, you know the the Lincoln movie. There's if you go to Youth Voices. Dot net slash Lincoln, you'll find resources for that. If you go to Youth Voices slash, uh, you know, Sandy Hook now, you'll find resources for that. And there's all sorts of other curriculum that we keep building together. So I just, it does, it does seem to me that it's more than just getting comments on kids' blogs, that it's, that there's something else in the community of teachers working together that we're aiming for as well. Um, and we want to kind of do that. We have a national writing project. Uh, a lot of us here, I think, are in the national writing project, local sites of the national writing project. So Gail's notion was, wouldn't it be great if we had that kind of community as well? Does that complicate it too much, Gail? Why don't you talk more now about that issue? No, I think um, I think actually you, you pretty much have nailed it. And I know um, you know Kevin is on with me too, and and Margaret, and, and the past couple of years, well, I think you know when we first connected and it worked well with the younger kids was when there was a sh the shared issue of the BP oil spill. Mm -hmm. So the voices from the Gulf, um, you know, it worked to have the elementary kids in. But you know, I think at the same time we felt like um, we needed you know a junior youth voices. So there was a place for our kids, you know, younger kids, to connect. Um, because you know, while obviously you can have a K through 12 um, community, I think that high, you know, our secondary kids should not be limited in conversations because of the elementary kids. You know, so. Um, and you know, as you're saying, not all conversations are appropriate at, um, at all levels. So, you know, so getting back to Susie's post um, a month ago on the quad blogging, when I checked into it, um, and it's uh, Dr. Mit or Mitchell, whatever, <laughs> David Mitchell, Mitchell David. <laughs> who, who, by the way, was, okay. w was very happy to come on the show, except that it's 2 a.m. Um, right. So, so if we can. If we can, um, maybe we, we should, let's just plan this, that uh, sometime in January or early February, we'll do an earlier show where he can come in and join us as well. Yeah, right. that would be great, so, but, you know, my, you know, one of the things, um, one of the things I think is so valuable about the Youth Voices community, though, is there's always the opportunity for the teachers to come together, you know, like tonight, and reflect on, you know, what's working, what's not, what do we want to change, you know. And so, in the quad blogging, you know, I posted a comment, um, but, you know, I'm one of thousands. Um, and so, although the comment was approved, you know, I didn't hear back. So, you know, it just made me think, hmm. Um, and then, um, in, in the room right now, in our chat room right now, um, Aman Danda has joined us. And Aman and I uh, co-presented an edge of blogs, a blogging thing on, on edge of blogs for our writing project last month. And you know, we just mentioned, we talked about youth voices and we talked about the quad blogging. And in the evaluations from our workshop participants, that came up over and over. They really wanted to hear more about this opportunity to get their classrooms connected in you know national and global kinds of communities. So um, you know, so it's easy for us to come back and tell, give them the particulars of you know this is how you connect your students with um, youth voices. You know, but we were also having this conversation of to have the, the uh, younger community. So, you know, it's just my thought and, you know, I grab both of you at um, the uh, uh, National Conference for Teachers of English conference last month about, you know, what if we set up 
a quad blocking kind of community for our elementary kids that was you know through the National Writing Project. So then you know, we have that community um, to come back and reflect um, and um, so it doesn't end at the end of three months, but you know continues on and and um, and and grows and improves um, based on input and need. You know, it do, it does strike me that um, in our effort to to kind of say here are all the possibilities that we might confuse a teacher who says I want to blog with my kids. And then we say, well, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this. You know, some of, some of us are like cool with that. And we'll find our own way, but maybe we do need a, a, a clearer answer. Um, so. Well, you know, I'm just going to say it. Any time I've mentioned it, um, and that whole concept of um, is it it um, once teachers see the value of blogging. And they're comfortable with it. Um, and oh, and Gail, I should. Gail Poulin is in here too. You know, the, the way we bring them on board is we show them Gail Poulin's kindergarten blog, and then they everybody kind of gets it. Um, but then the next step is um, to not be blogging in an empty room. You know that that the kids actually their voices are heard, and you know, and we see that happen over and over in youth voices, where kids find a passion, you know, photography or whatever it is, and you know, they make these connections, um, and they're writing and they're learning and they're reading and writing when they don't have to be, and so I'd like to see those same options um, where we can organize these connections um, and in a quad blogging kind of way. Mm -hmm. Gail, do you want to describe your blog a little more? Gail Pullen? When, how did you start it? And, yeah. I'm unmuting my microphone. There you go. <laughs> um, seven, uh, five years ago, um, I followed my mentor, Kevin, uh, along to Edge Blogs. <laughs> Where I met Sue Waters, hi Sue, and um, and and through them I learned about my own blogging experience there, and it took forever to get there. But what was kind of cool was I had that anonymity for so long; uh, nobody was reading it, as far as I was concerned, and that worked out just fine. <laughs> I didn't want anyone reading it because I was far too shy of a person. But I had some nice comments and. And I had to grow and develop my own ideas about my message and who I wanted to have for an audience. And that makes a huge difference. Our students need to know who they're going to be talking to. But can, can I just, I mean, I think it's an important point that you just made there, though. It takes time to develop that blog voice and that, that community. And often, often in a classroom, we don't have that kind of time, you know? You're right. Go ahead. Good points. Yeah. And there's so many parts to it. It is a, the you know it's great if we all have a message that we want to share with people. But when I brought my kids to Kid Blog a couple years ago, mm -hmm. it was so painful for me because they didn't have the letter and sound knowledge to build it, to find the letter on a, on a QWERTY keyboard, and um, to know they needed to use a space in order to make sense. So in a way, it kind of the blogging in kindergarten. It kind of got in the way, trying to put it in a print form, which is why we start all of our writing projects by building the foundation. So when they reach the rest of you, they're ready to run with it, and they can speak in complete sentences with lots of detail. And so we start with the speaking and listening foundation skills, telling us more about their thinking. And I have a few tools I use to develop the speaking and listening skills. And then that's, I that's VoiceThread and yeah, Skype and, and Skype. Okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's see if I can add. There, I just added a link uh, into the chat that was um, a really great project. It brought together Skype and VoiceThread, and in that we had questions for our our pals in the Kiki in Honolulu. 
And we had Skype with them a few times where we would have scripted uh, questions from both sides. They would take turns. They would manage and organize what they were going to say. Uh, so then we created a voice thread. And in this, we're asking our Kiki pals some questions. And then the Kiki pals are responding. They followed up with a voice thread of their own, with their own questions. What, what, what kinds of questions were you asking? I'm sorry, I'm not more you familiar. You have a yeah. dog. Um, uh -huh. Okay, what do you like so get flat? to know you kind of questions, huh? Yeah, yeah, and that's where they're most familiar, and you know that's a big, uh, another big point too. When we learn in early childhood that your lessons start close to home, that the younger mm -hmm. a child is, the closer to stories about family you're going to do. Then you're going to branch out to your neighborhood, then to your school community, then to the local community. And as they get to you guys, the older guys, they're going to be ready to go out, reach out across the ocean, and, and tap into some folks across the world. But first they start close to home with a simpler story, with familiar topics, and their, their personal experience is quite limited. So are you using Edublog now, or Kidblog, or some combination, or n nothing, or no, Skype, or what are you doing? <laughs> okay. Well, um, it's kind of cool to create text on paper. Then I scan them <laughs> in and input into VoiceThread. Now the kids have their text, their illustration and words, either teacher written, their writing, combination of both. Then I like the kids to read their text, which they can't do. They don't know how to read yet, but they can tell the story. And that's the voice that we're seeking from the youngest writers and we want them to organize their thinking to fill in the details. I watched uh, just in preparation for tonight, I looked at one particular year where I had one child who wouldn't speak at all in the beginning of the year and by the end, and she was a reader and a writer when she came to kindergarten, but she wasn't going to be oral at all. And then she took off and she was much more confident when she left me. All of the children grow all of the children spend more time in developing their story and they do a much better job by the end of the year. Not only that, you see lots of evidence of their own writing at that time, their own printing, their invented spellings. Uh, but when they read their story, they often add in a lot more detail than they have on the text. Hmm. And Gail, are you, but you're embedding the um, voice threads on your blog, right? I do because I want to share that. On a class blog or your blog? It happens to be both. It's my personal blog, but it's the one that if you go to the school website and you click on it, you, uh, you're you taken to that. And that's really the only blog I work on. I have another blog that I rarely get to anymore because there's just not enough hours in the day. That's my reflection blog, but I, I can get it both, both done. So I love to use Skype. To develop conversations with real people, and I like to use VoiceThread for sharing the actual, the graphic images as well as their speaking and listening, um, mm -hmm. and it's very effective in, in building all of the literacy skills that they need. I think that uh, we we tend to give short shrift to the speaking and listening part. And that is where the children are organizing themselves for later on writing. It's so much easier for a kid to tell you what he did last weekend than say, write what you did. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, Kevin, how, how do you handle kids getting their work out there? I mean, you do so many, so many amazing things with your students. Um, but I'm not sure they publish it on a blog or anything. Or I mean, you have a class blog, right? How do you how do you handle that or think about that? Yeah, we we um we do have a class blog, although um, you know, we use it kind of. I guess we use it more as a publishing space than a, a kind of community writing space. I think a lot of times, uh, although it does depend on the assignment that we're doing, um, and uh, it's more of a way for them to have a publishing area for the different kind of media things that we're doing. I think more than anything else. Uh, but in, in thinking about the quad blogging um, idea, when Gail mentioned it, it took me a while to kind of think about what she was talking about. <laughs> she had to bump into me a couple of times, I think. Um, 
But you know what it reminded me of is some projects that we've done, and some of us have been on that. Which is uh, a number of years ago, we had done a, a youth kind of radio podcasting site where we did connect kids, uh, middle school, high, uh, elementary school kids, um, using podcasting. And we had schools from around the world um, sharing things um, and kind of writing about what, what they were hearing in our voices. And this is getting to what Gail Poulin's talking about, too. Um, and thinking, too, of the shifts in, um, in for us in the Common Core uh, around speaking and listening uh, really kind of rising up and how much we need to kind of make sure we're paying attention to that. Um, so I was thinking of the youth radio, then I was thinking, as we mentioned with Margaret, too, the uh, Voices on the Gulf, and, you know, that was a great year where the environment was our kind of central focus for so much of the inquiry work we did that year, and the Voices on the Gulf was just a great site for my students to be reading, um, understanding what was going on in other parts of the country, and then participating in that conversation as well. Um, and, you know, we kind of started to dabble a little with... Um, with youth voices and then shied away, I think, because of the mix of ages. Um, I got a little nervous about it, I think, um, and kind of backed off uh, from it from there. And, uh, you know, part, so part of the idea I think that is interesting is, you know, if there are ways that we can find ways to kind of pull, um, pull the age levels that we're talking about kind of together and give them a way to have a shared audience and... I think it'd be great to have a shared inquiry theme too. I think that would help me as a teacher and our students to stay focused on it too. And I'm just thinking about the experiences from the Voices of the Gulf and how powerful that was to have that theme running all year long. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter what we were doing, we were kind of connected it back to our views of the environment, either locally or globally. Um, and that was really a powerful motivation uh, kind of uh, motivation tool for my students to be writing about all year because they were pretty passionate about it. Um, so, uh, you know, in thinking and then, also... And then whatever, whatever tools you use, like you use Glogster and other things, mm -hmm. but, I mean, the tools on some level don't matter. I mean, they do, but you could use a, ver a variety of tools as long yeah. as kids are getting their voices out there. Yeah. yeah, and the beauty of so much of it is that, um, you know, it is, it is relatively easy to mix those tools together you know, uh, you know, if it's a blogging platform and you can embed things in there, well, the blogging is just, I think the container is a great <laughs> kind of thing that you talked about. You know, that that's a space where things are and are, are things that are happening, but if we're pulling in different media, VoiceThread, Glockster, or whatever it happens to be, and we can pull those together into a space where we're all together, I mean, that's the key part of it. And, uh, you know, more and more, that, that seems to be um, easier to do. So. Yeah. Tony, you have any thoughts you want to throw in at this point? Um, <laughs> some of the, uh, well, I've done blogging with my kids um, in the past. and uh, How? Explain details yeah, a little bit. We, um, a couple of years ago, I was working with them um, trying to set up a blog where in the classroom they were doing like novel studies. So they might be in groups of four reading novels with each other. Um, based on interest and um, using the blog as a space to talk to each other back and forth about what they were understanding, misunderstanding, um, enjoying about um, the books. And I haven't done that in a couple of years. It was it was an interesting experiment. Um, I'm doing more, like I said earlier, with uh, Twitter, which I guess would be kind of like microblogging, um, mm -hmm. where the kids are having the opportunity to reflect at the end of the day instead of like working in their notebook on their reflection or actually kind of tapping into other conversations that other um, classes are having on Twitter. I, I was amazed when we um, when I created the um, Twitter feed for the kids how many other teachers are actually kind of dabbling with this. Uh -huh. With Twitter, in particular. Yeah, yeah, with Twitter as a way to like get their ideas out. Um, one day, I um, it was it was really nice out here in Charlotte, um, and I took a picture of the kids because I took them outside to read, and um, I posted the picture on Twitter on our feed, and I said, "This is what 
reading looks like today in Charlotte. And then like a couple of days later, um, another class followed us and um, they posted a picture. All the kids were like on a, the jungle gym thing, that like spider web kind of thing. But they all had winter jackets on. And <laughs> you, could see, you could see snow. And my kids got like really excited. They wanted to know where these people were. So like this, you know, authentic conversation started up and, you know, they started tweeting back and forth to each other, talking to each other about, you know, what it was like to live in. Um, I think I think the group was uh, somewhere in uh, Washington, the state of Washington. Um, so they started, you know, doing a little exchange back and forth of what it was like to live in the different cities. Hmm. And before before we started the official part of this broadcast, um, you said that you're looping with your kids between third and fourth grade. So yeah. you actually have some time that you could develop um, we did, yeah. Skills. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we did a little bit with um, Twitter last year, not as much as I'm trying to do with it this year. I'm also trying to use um, this other site that um, a colleague of mine in our writing project turned me on to um, this mm -hmm. summer called Today's Meet, which is kind of mm -hmm. Twitter-like. I can put the feed or the website up here in a second. Mm -hmm. Um, for people to check it out. It's like a controlled space where you can have uh, back chatter about like what's going on in the classroom. So um, about a month ago I was getting observed doing a social studies lesson and I created this Today's Meet where the kids could um, get on during the lesson and while they were doing activities to talk to each other uh, about what was going on during the lesson, what they liked about the lesson, what they were confused with, um, and then also have a conversation about the topic, um, the content of the lesson. How did the observer like that or not like it, or what did they say? The administrator loved it. He thought mm -hmm. it was cool that I was integrating it into the, you know, the context of the lesson. Cool. I actually sent him a link because, um, like, I, you know, I could send it to any one of you, and you could jump on and you know, talk to the kids. So I sent him the link at the end of the day and before I left he had responded to the kids and told them how cool he thought it was that they were, you know, trying to use the technology during the, um, you know, the course of the lesson. So let's talk about KidBlog for a second and see how, um, how you, you've heard a bunch of these questions and I We've got, what, 10 minutes left? And I have no idea how we're oh, going to wow. even clarify what the question is here. But if, if uh, <laughs> Susie, can you help us do that? But um, Margaret, you, you're, you're using KidBlog. And then um, let's go over to hear what Matt, what, what he's been thinking about some of our questions. Yes, my, um, my students have been using, are, is there an echo in here? You're good. Okay. We don't hear it. Yeah. Okay. Um, they're, um, they've been using the kid blogs, and because I teach at two schools, it's been very effective for having conversations with um, the students that go to the two different schools. And, um, you know, I, I often transfer writing prompts between the two schools. So, um, you know, like if we're writing. Uh, recently, we were writing winter poems, and so I just put in on the kid blogs as a post winter poems, and then everyone has to write their winter poems in the in the comments section. Mm -hmm. um, but the the other thing that's been going on um, that's kind of uh, exciting is that the students are, um, you know, they will come in and say. I wrote a story today, and I would like to put that on the kid blog so everybody can see it. So they're, you know, they are they're generating content as well as um, as me. And then I've also used it with um, groups of students who are reading the same book, and um, across the two different schools, and they're, you know, they're writing their responses to the book. So um, is it mainly those the kids in both those schools who are communicating with each other? Right, right. It is it, you know it's it's password protected, so we're not we're not opening it up to the public at all. Um, and uh, you know there, I see the goodness of that. the The thing that's good about that is that they are they feel a sense of safety about what they're writing, and because they know who they're writing it to, in a sense, you know they're not. Um, Mm -hmm. They're not communicating with a stranger, and they're not putting it out there for a stranger to look at. Um, but 
in the, at the same time, when we do stuff on Youth Voices and when we were doing the Voices on the Gulf, there, when they got responses, when they published things and got responses from strangers, it was a huge motivator. Um, so I can I can see how how both work. Um, I just tend I, the kid blocks has worked well for me this year, and I and I'm I just feel like I'm in the the company of a star here because I <laughs> I've loved it so much. But one well, of the one of the aspects like that I like that I like to, um, well, one of the things I like to do is I like to be able to track what they're doing because I use a rubric system to grade them. And you know it's very easy. You go in the comments and you look at the comments and you can say see what kids have and how many comments they've made. And um, so there are lots of features about it that have been uh, very good for me as a teacher to use. For assessing them and everything. So. Well, that's that's great to hear. Um, yeah. So, um, the, it sounds like Paul, you wanted me to sort of try to address the yeah, question here. Whatever. About, yeah. Yeah. I actually. Help, it, help us. Help us define the question. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I was going to say, if you don't mind, I'll answer the question with a question because I think this mm. this kid blog right now is working on some pretty significant um, uh, feature development that is going to facilitate just what we're talking about today: the ability for teachers and students to find each other around communities or topics um, in a way that still protects like what Margaret is talking about if, if you want to be password protected or if you want to be totally public and out there but just a way to um, essentially search, follow, read, comment, all of that stuff and, and that's it's actually kind of a hard problem to get right it, with all of these different nuances and different privacy um, requirements that people have. So I was just curious for the panel if you think that there's um, more value, and maybe it's a mix of both, but do you, do you see more value in coming together around a topic, um, like we talked about, obviously, uh, the, the school shooting tragedy or the Gulf oil spill, right? So these shared experiences that allow kind of a, a cohesive conversation to be woven throughout, or do you think that before you can really even engage in that, you need to focus more on the people or the group that you're talking to, almost like a pen pal situation where you help. It helps to sort of know the person on the other end of that 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 communication line. Mm -hmm. um, basically, is it the people or is it the theme that is more important, uh, or it maybe the primary um, piece that you have to get connected over? Hey, can, I, can, I, can I add a third dimension there, which I think Youth Voices is pushing, which is personal inquiry, right? Mm -hmm. Which, um, and, and, then, and then the themes become more by accident. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I'm also interested in that. Yeah. So, which is different than a, yeah, than an established theme or a class to class. But, uh, yeah. Hmm. Sorry. Uh I mean, I'll jump in a little bit. I think that um, when you when you asked that question, Matt, I was thinking both. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I think that they're because they're they both have a lot of value, um, and maybe for different things. I think building a community um, with, uh, let's say, some other classes, you know, builds a, a different kind of writing community than if it's a theme that you're writing on, or um, uh, you know, for talking like an event, let's say, uh, because then. You know, the students are writing from a different place. Uh, I think that they're writing from a reactive place in that kind of situation, as opposed to developing their voice in the kind of community sense. Um, mm -hmm. So, in some ways, the ideal site has kind of both of those things going. And um, you know, one of the things that Paul talked about that I always really liked about looking at youth voices is, um, you know, the use of tags and keywords to be able to um, connect. Uh, one student's inquiry and their personal kind of investigation with others, and I think you know that's a key kind of component of the architecture of ways that um, you know they discover other people who have the same kind of shared interests. I always thought that was a you know I mean the power of not just the hyperlink there, but the the tagging that can go on if you tag correctly. I think is really yeah. an amazing feature of uh, of online communities. But do you know? Could I rush in to say that part of what makes that work is public, right? So that you, yeah. you, you and and you don't think of that. But so many things get limited by the private when things are put behind privacy behind passwords, and tagging across a community of a body of work 
is is one of those things that I think is kind of becomes kind of limited in some way. When, but yeah, yeah again, I, I could I I don't know the technology well enough. But I think that's those are some of the issues around some of that. Um, and and just to clarify, just Kidlock does have a private setting, but also you can be as public as you as you want as you want to be. So just in case someone wasn't sure about that. So you could you could be. You could be just your class. You could be like um, Margaret's to another school, or you could be public, totally wide, public kind of thing. Wide, mm -hmm. wide open, yeah. So if we, if I think one of the things that, uh, and maybe I was speaking for Gail Desler, <laughs> and uh, shut me off if I am not, but you know, one of the things we're, I think we're trying to figure out is like, so if we do this, if we move ahead with this idea, like where do we do this, right? Um, and so I guess I'll, if it's okay if I throw this out to you, Matt. So, yeah. ha so if we're thinking of um, kid blogs, I guess I don't want to pitch against another site, but let's say Edmodo, right? Sure. Uh, which also has communities and also has a lot of the features that we're talking about. Like, so I mean, how 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 do we kind of make a judgment or edgy blogs or whatever it happens to be, or you know? How do we or, kind of figure out? Or like, Kevin, you could forward. you could also set up a junior U voices, right? True. Yes, uh, your, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So I'm just trying to figure like how do we know what yeah. what's best for us and any advice that I think would be helpful. Yeah, I'll just say I think the strength of Kidblog in this particular aspect is when you're connecting entire classes with each other, that you Kidblog really is centered on the class experience, um, but. Unlike Edmodo, it has a, more of a focus on the long-form content. So like uh, Gail Bloom was talking about earlier, even with kindergartners, if they're doing voice threads and, and mm -hmm. we're not, we don't want to like uh, burden them with the physical typing of things, um, whether it's the teacher, whether it's a parent helper, um, there's ways to embed that kind of stuff into these posts. So again, yeah. it's, I think the chat was talking about how it doesn't need to just be text. But what I would do with, with quad blogging is I would just... Depending on your privacy settings, you'd connect with four other classes, you'd put them in your blog role on the side, and when students are either publishing or commenting, that's how they navigate between the, the network. Um, and it's just sort of all right there, self-contained. Uh, Susie, um, quad blogging, do, do the four, is it four classes that work together? Um, yes. And, and do they work around a topic? Or how does that right. work? Right. So, um, I mean, it's a pretty simple setup. And the idea is just, I mean, initially it began with, okay, we'll shift each week a different one of the four is kind of the spotlight class, and the other three classes read and comment. And then the next week it's a different, you know, different class is kind of in the spotlight and the others are in the commenter role. Um, and that was just the initial idea that it's a way to draw more audience, get more interaction. Um, you know, so that your student writers are feeling like they're reaching someone, that someone's listening, and the idea was really to motivate them. But I think what what you're talking about is, um, you know, something a little um, more nuanced than that. It's it's not simply publishing and getting comments, but in many cases, you know, um, at Kevin, as you're talking about this kind of shared inquiry or starting with personal inquiry and finding out what other perspectives are there you know in this community on this topic and um, you know that that kind of takes you in some different directions I think um, and I guess I would throw out one other idea just because I, I um, just heard about this project and it, it was pretty inspiring and I'll be uh, posting about it soon but it, it was a teacher in in Africa in Lesotho um, and it's a good example of why sometimes having commenters of different ages is a good idea. Sometimes it's not, but if you have to think about, you know, what's my purpose here? And these were high school students who were really struggling with Shakespeare. Um, context was unfamiliar, language was difficult, and it was on their national exam, and they were not doing well. And um, the teacher, and I'll try to speed this up, but she basically had them rewrite it in a way that made sense to them and then they filmed it, um, put it on YouTube and they've basically become the kind of um, the African version of Julius Caesar which is great. Um, but what really helped them understand the play was um, conversations that they had online with teachers or pre-service educators, so folks who were coming through the pipeline to become English teachers, um, connected with them online and I think they just used Facebook, they didn't have blogs. Um, but kids had access to Facebook and they used that and that became a discussion site so that they could 
you know, kids who were really thinking about the character of Brutus or Julius Caesar or whomever would have then sort of a, they'd be paired up with a teacher educator who helped them, you know, dig into this character in a way that um, they couldn't do in a class of, I want to tell you that it was one teacher and 150 students, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it accomplished a lot, but but the, the value for them was getting that dialogue going with um, people who did have a different um, perspective and were older and um, wrote at kind of a different level. Um, so I wouldn't throw that out. I wouldn't think that, you know, you always need to keep just elementary kids together, or just high school kids, and sometimes there's some great um, mentoring that can happen and take the conversation in, you know, other directions by mixing it up. And it does strike me that if, if the, whatever it's, whether it's quad or more than that, right? But but if we could if we could establish those by topic, then it, then like the you know whether or not I'm bisexual, which you know my my high school students want to talk about, and your sixth graders might not want to. Right. That, that, but but if the topic is the environment, you know, um, or whatever, maybe that's a way to to get the ages mixed in some way too. Right. 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 Um, and it does seem like it, it, it would be true, isn't it? Um, Matt, confirm this for me that that you could quad blog from a kid blog, right? Like a class could be in kid blog, but they could still they could still agree to comment on each other's things across can, different classes. Yeah, I can Margaret, speak about yeah. that because we've we've done it with the um, the parish wide gifted program. Um, you know, we took a we all took a field trip together, and so we created a kid blog a, around that field trip. We also have a sixth grade project that we're doing, that's ongoing throughout the year, and we're using kid blog for that too. So we're connecting throughout the schools in the whole parish, um, and it's it it pretty much works the same way as it works with a class. Um, and and what's cool is these kids are, they have met because they live in the same area and they go you know they go to things together but they're not in the same school and so it's a way for us um, gifted teachers to connect gifted kids across the um, across the parish because sometimes they're very isolated one or two in a school you know. Mm -hmm. okay. I would add too if I, if I may I would add that again you have to go back to your audience. Um, and so when I was using Kid Log with my class a couple of years ago, it was a tremendous amount of work for me because I was basically doing it unassisted in the classroom and dashing from student to student. But it was shared with the parents, and the parents were leaving the comments. And that was a kindergarten class, and that's a great beginning. Um, and it wouldn't be long after that that I could see them sharing second grade would be a fabulous year to start crossing classrooms. Even if they may even be across the hall. They don't have to be across the world. Um, but another thing I would say is I would recommend Kid Blog as well because Kid Blogs has a beautiful platform interface that's not intimidating. It's very simple to navigate. My kids couldn't type words, couldn't find the letters. But it was an easy thing to teach blogging because it really had the most basic thing. Well, I'm glad to hear that. That's that's how, how we designed it, and so I'm glad to hear that that's how it's uh, carrying through. So we're we're um, over time, and 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 if you all can agree that this is, we're just trying to break out the question here. I I mean I think it's I think it's a really important question to think about. How we get audience, authentic audience, and conversation going between kids, um, and and respect individual places and group places, and try to mix it all together. I mean, I I can't I, can't, I wish I could say it more clearly, but that's where I am right now. Gail, I, I want to come back to you um, for kind of last word here tonight. Though, where do you think we are, and what might we do um, to go the next step? I mean, we should try a couple things too. But yeah, you know. for, so for instance, um, you know, quad blogging is taking their sign up for the January through March. You know, so you know, maybe putting that out for teachers, give that a try, and then we continue the conversations about 
um, do we need to set up something um, mm -hmm. that's more writing national writing project based um, that's a that's a more reflective piece um, or maybe just you know use what's are already out there but you know it just seems like um, I think what I liked about quad blocking is it seemed like whatever platform you use, whatever program you used, you could just stick with that and connect that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that sounds like um, what we're all after here. Um, I, and I'm going to give us all a break. Thank you so much. I want to say for coming at this holiday season when there are concerts and shopping and. Uh, Chris Sloan is uh, at his son's basketball game tonight, and uh, anyway, so I uh, so thank you all for coming and um, please thanks for the do, invite. Yeah, please do come back and, and continue this conversation. Maybe yeah. we'll try to do it sooner so our friends in in, um, in England who are who are working with this kind of issue. Mm. Um, uh, there are a couple other people who are doing it too um, from over there, um, and so maybe sometime in January. We, we can we can get together again and, and continue this conversation. But thank you all. Um, and we're we're gonna say good night uh, by saying we wanna thank um, Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier um, who have set up edtechtalk.com and worldbridges.net. And uh, that's where you can find this. You can also find it at teacherstechingteachers.org. And by the way, within a half an hour, this goes up as a video um, on YouTube. So you can just sort of search for it and uh, find it. It's on, on well, you can, you can find it at teacherstechingteachers.org. And so, along with the conversation in the chat room too, right, Paul? Uh, yes, the chat room will be there as well. And the links and so forth that people have there. Thanks. So thank you all. And thank you, um, Paul. good night. Thanks. Have a great, great season. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye. Good night.